Okay, well, hello everybody. My name is Sandy Baird and we're here with What's Happening and this is July, I guess, 27th. Uh, and we're still into the coronavirus period. With me today is Ian Stokes, who is our wonderful technician. He's able to manage all this stuff on Zoom. And Mark Estrin, our local philosopher and a musician <laughs> and many other things, jack of all trades, or we could call him a Renaissance man and Pete Garitano, who is also a Renaissance man, and well, he is in New Jersey, and I'm happy to see him. So because his uh, Zoom, he has told me it might be a bit, little bit questionable, uh, we will ask him to begin with what's happening in the news and his comments. So go ahead, Pete. Well, I um, have been very bored, like people who don't have a job and, uh, so I've spent way more time than I ever thought I would on the computer pretty much every morning from five to eight or nine and hours and hours and hours kind of looking at um, data and statistics, which is always kind of dangerous um, because of course statistics can be shaped any way you want them to be shaped. Um, so I was prompted by uh, Catherine Austin, Austin Fitz somebody whose uh, webpage I read a lot to read a book which she recommended called Virus Mania. And it really changed my view of some things in that I should kind of look into things more closely um, that many previous pandemics have not panned out the way they were necessarily advertised. Um, and so I started looking at this one just to see if it had followed the pattern of many of the other, the MERS and the SARS and the swine flu and the avian flu. And this book goes into polio and AIDS and everything else. And it's very interesting, offers another uh, possible explanation um, that is often overlooked in these things, which would be um, outside agents instead of um, something in the body that was initiated not from eating an animal, but maybe from toxins in the atmosphere, maybe from pesticides, um, which was blamed for uh, polio in this book, from uh, really, really toxic drugs being in ingested, it, which was blamed on the AIDS crisis. Um, just alternate explanations that had seemed to have validity, and it's, it's very well footnoted. It's, this is all you know, written by a virologist and a doctor, and one of the doctors is still practicing currently. So I, I recommend the book to anybody who it, it was, it's been a learning experience to me because I'm certainly not a doctor or a virologist or an epidemiologist or any of those things. But it's, um, we all are probably aware that the uh, medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry is not always doing things in our best interest. And there's been a lot of fraud, certainly in studies and, and CDC and who are partially funded by these same companies that stand to make money off of there. Now, I, I want to, I don't want to get people too riled up. So I don't want to, I am not saying that there's nothing happening right now. And I'm not an expert. But there are a lot of questions. And even, even the stuff in the news, and most of the stuff I've been reading has really been from the WHO, the WHO, I should keep calling it the WHO, it sounds like a rock band. Um, the WHO, the CDC, uh, John Hopkins University is a really good site. It's just data and statistics and another one that's, that's called World Meter. And then I've been looking you know, at pneumonia statistics and flu statistics and all the respiratory illnesses back in history of other pandemics and things just to see you know, what is going on. And just, it's, it's very interesting. And, and I'm not sure that I have a grasp on any positive um, explanation other than what is what has been explained, but there are a lot of questionable things. And and the and the first one, and then I'll get off get off of this subject, is that the the test that's being used called the PCR test, which I've read at least a hundred articles about this test, wasn't designed to do what it's being that's used to being done. It was designed as a um, research tool, not as a diagnostic tool, and is being used to diagnose the illness because it is rather quick compared to cell cultures, which are slow and more expensive. So the question of how many cases there really are in the asymmetric cases, asymmetric, I'm sorry, asymptomatic cases, which is really what's caused the biggest panic is when we've been told that the asymptomatic cases can also be 
uh, transmit to other people are, are transmissible. Well, in previous epidemics of any kind, people weren't tested that had no symptoms. So this changes the data mm -hmm. significantly right. from the other, the other diseases that have come along. Basically, if you were sick, you'd go in, they test you, you'd be hospitalized or sent home, and that's how the cases were recorded. This one's been different because tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are going in to be tested. The only thing similar was kind of AIDS, because people had been worried and they'd go in if they had multiple sex, sex partners and got tested. And so this is the unique thing about the testing of this particular disease, is that healthy, uh, apparently healthy people are going in to be tested and being told they have this genetic, uh, the viral RNA, which is what it tests for. But and, in then, and then it's reported and uh, people then become aware or uh, right. that there's, there's all these cases out there and then people, I guess, agree to shut down too. To, uh, right. Well, it, it creates a big number yeah. of cases that may necessarily, not necessarily be harmful to anybody. Right. And so that's the unique thing about this. And as it turns out, this, this test does not really test for infectious virus. What it tests for is viral RNA that a little piece of matches up to what has been shown in a photograph of, a, of an electron microscope to be this viral RNA that can be infectious. The only way to prove that it's infectious is still to then take that piece and, 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 and to uh, purify it, identify it, and put it in a lab culture and do that. But that's not being done because it takes too long. So what they're doing right. is they've kind of done a shortcut thing using this PCR technology to say, yes, it's possible that you may get this infectious disease that we've called SARS-CoV-2. And so that's kind of the initial big Well, it's called coronavirus mark. 19, right? Right, but it's called SARS-CoV-2 uh, because the first one was called SARS-CoV-1 now. The oh. one that out in so this, this, this then is maybe a form of SARS? Well, it is. It's, it's, it's very similar to the one that happened in 2007 that really didn't affect the United, I mean, 2003, that really didn't affect the United States a whole lot. Mm -hmm. it, I think it killed very few people here, but it killed uh, people in China and, and, the, and the Far East. Um, but it wasn't as big a deal. It might have been 10,000 infections and a couple thousand killed, but it certainly made the news. And, and we were worried here that it would come here, but it never really took hold. It kind of disappeared yeah. before anything happened which is what some people think will just happen to this, but... Um, well, so. well, but the, the SARS didn't just go away. It, the first one? It, the first one, yeah, in 2003, and subsequently it was... Uh, and, and the difference was that it was transmitted much less readily, um, although I think it's... Um, its fatality rate was similar, but with suit, it, what, it didn't just go away, it, with suitable precautions, it was made to disappear, and uh, and it really did totally. Um, the, there there are different obviously there are differences in the present um, disease, the virus that we have. Um, it's only been around to our knowledge, to scientists' knowledge, for six months. So it's it's really remarkable how much has been learned about it in six months. But there's still obviously, as you point out, Peter, you know, a lot of unknowns, and um, um, so researchers well, well, and others yeah. they have to keep chipping away at it and, and right. you know when, and we hope... went, when i said it went away it wasn't cured it just kind of went away right it's, i mean it, yeah. it's kind of a difference between uh, right it wasn't magic but it just what happens is they things dilute and and like it, it's not as powerful and italian doctors have already suggested that this one is also also diluted and the strains they're looking at now aren't as bad as what they were who knows it's it's you know <laughs> the precautions that were used to suppress the transmission of the first SARS, very, very similar to what have been used for this present right. COVID-19. Well, well, um, would... The difficulty is that um, COVID-19 is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a worse, uh, um, presents worse challenges, more difficult challenges. So it's more difficult to reduce the prevalence of it, to reduce the transmissibility. And I mean, talking about unknowns, I think the biggest unknown really is the real details of how this thing gets transmitted from one person to another. You know, we think we've, we've isolated it and then it just sort of pops up um, somewhere else, it seems. And, you know, and the tracing is not... I, I suppose the tracing isn't in good enough um, 
shape to be able to identify exactly the chain of, of transmission to the peep to the places where it apparently just pops up. Well, right. I, I would just like to make one comment about what Pete was saying. I think he's he is as a, a lay person done this remarkable research, and I think what he's trying to say is that it might not be as uh, prevalent. Well, it is prevalent, I guess, but it might not be as dangerous as had been predicted. Um, but there's a second thing that I want to take issue with you a little bit, Ian, and that is that there's been no other pandemic that has caused a world shutdown, never in history. That's what I would guard as terribly uh, weird about this one. This one has collapsed the entire world economy. Like my sister was saying, well, that happened in the Spanish flu. No, it didn't. There were people who were quarantined in the Spanish flu. There were people who churches were shut down in certain areas, but the economy wasn't collapsed. Well, ever, I, think, ever. I, I don't think any nation has ever done that before. I, I don't know. It's, you know, there are, we're talking about two related yeah. similar things, but there, there are differences. But, but the um, 1918 flu, mm -hmm. sometimes called Spanish flu, right. um, that I, th I think it killed eight million people. Um, right. So we're not we're not there yet, and the global population was smaller at that time. Um, but it, so uh, you know, there are there are clearly similarities. The economy was very different. So the yes, impact yes, was, no, but the economy still the mm -hmm. economy. That's what I find so curious is that obviously the shutdown though has benefited certain capitalist companies like Big Pharma, like Amazon, like other big internet companies. It In the Democratic a, Party right now. Right. And they, In a but, big way. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not saying they're causing it, but it's certainly no, benefiting no, we, them, yeah. Wait, well, we won't go there. I just want no, to... No, I know. I'm sorry. We can't. In a way, we can't go there because we don't have that evidence. But we do see the real victims of this shutdown. The real victims are small business and ordinary people who have to work for a living. Those are the real victims. And also, I would argue that the shutdown has damaged whatever left whatever is left of a democracy in the first place. You know, as I've mentioned a million times, which Mark will take issue with maybe, is that City Hall is closed. In other words, the mayor is operating behind screens. I don't know what he's doing. Passing stuff, shutting down streets. How can you even approach him? I don't even know where he is. But anyway, those to me are the biggest, but if you look at the economic victims, the economic victims are small business and ordinary working class and poor people, largely, again, the real victims have been minorities and black people who are not able to work anymore. And they're not able to work from home because that's not the kind of jobs they've ever had. And so I don't know who's, who, why yeah, does that happen? Well, I, I don't want, want to talk about this forever, but like I said, yeah. every day I, I get up and I think about something in my, I'm at my mom's house in Delaware and she asked me a question today that I didn't know the answer to. And I had looked up how many people die of the flu and pneumonia each year because what this virus is, and I think I'm right, is it's something that basically gives you a deadly form of pneumonia that you die from. Yeah. That's what the first stars was described as. So the virus gives you a pneumonia, you die from the pneumonia. But she said, well, how many people die of pneumonia? But I looked that up. Then I looked up in 2019, how many people had symptoms of pneumonia and went to the, hospital, went to the doctor, 30 million. 500,000 people just in 2019 were hospitalized because of pneumonia and about 150,000 died. So those are 30 million people in the U.S. that had symptoms of pneumonia. We've had 6 million that were asymptomatic, 80% of them. So we've had maybe 800,000 with symptoms of COVID, whereas last year we had 30 million with pneumonia and 30 million with the flu. So there were 60 million people that had something like a fever or cold, went to the doctor, got diagnosed with either pneumonia or the flu, and about 10% of them ended up in the hospital and about another 10% of those died. I never realized there were that many people every year that had those illnesses to that point. So when I look at the grand scheme of things, once again, I'm not denying that something bad's happening, but to Sandy's point, those are all infectious also, but only symptomatic infectious. And I think the biggest differences here is we've said that the asymptomatic people can give the other people the disease and that hasn't been proven anywhere. I looked in every study I could find and there's these weird like maybes from China and Germany. If you take all the asymptomatic people out, you just have bad 
and maybe another bad flu or virus that a fraction of the people that have gotten sick from flu have gotten sick from, and about the same percentage, 10% are dying. I'm not denying it's out there. I think the hype has been the biggest hype ever. And, and like, like, like Sandy said, what's happened here, if we had just said, if you have a fever or cold, stay home, stay away from people, don't go out, wear a mask, I don't care. But it's the panic over the asymptomatic thing and these diagnoses from the, 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 um, the test that are causing people to worry more than they should have in the past for other diseases. So, I mean, well, but it sounds like the, yeah, but the, the morbidity and mortality is one thing, and they're pretty bad. I mean, the COVID 19 has become one of the major killers in the United States and in other places, with a, what is it, 140,000 or so as we speak, but they're all five have, to, have died. But the but I I'd like to go back to the economic impact because yeah, right, that's something right, that you know right. potentially something can be done about that and and Congress is attempting to do something about that. Maybe. Um, they've been Maybe. at it for a while and they haven't come up as we speak anyway with a with a, with a, a plan that can be implemented. I mean that can be passed by both houses and and signed by the president and so. But there the, the, these are the measures that. Um, or within the power of, of our government to mitigate the the, the, the the bad consequences of the economic impact. So uh, so that's something that can be done. And I, I think it's um, it's it's quite striking that the the federal government has really been very slow. It was very fast to act for, with the first package, but it's been extremely slow to act on the second package. I, well, I suspect out of a false sense of optimism that, you know, the, the well, problem would go away without there's needing there's action. Another, there's another solution also, in, at mm. least to get back to where we were, which was already a sorry state economically. There is the plan to reopen, which has been jettisoned over and over and over by a report that all these cases are spiking. California's back into shutdown mode. Um, other places are considering shutting down again. What the, I'll just say what I think is the problem with the, eco, with the economic recovery that Trump did do, and that the Democrats approved and that the Republicans approved, it was giving free money to people. I'm not, I, that wasn't made, I don't know enough economics, although I'm going to get an economic expert to tell me about it. He was basically printing money and sending it to people. I was very grateful myself to get 1200 bucks in the mail. That cannot go on. And the biggest mistake that they made was for young people who had shitty jobs, they were giving a young person like my grandson 600 bucks a week extra over his unemployment benefits. Do you think he wanted to go back to work? Why? So well, so what we're seeing um, in the drafts that are appearing in, in Washington, D.C., right. are, uh, the, the main items that I've been aware of that affect people per individually are, are the $600 increase in unemployment benefits right. are, are really in question. I mean, yep. the unemployed seem to be the people who are in most in need of the funds, but what doesn't seem to be in question is now a 1200 per person hand out to so that, people, that's what we whether, whether they need it or not. You know, right. whether uh, but we got employed. that last time and people do need it. Of course they need it. It, it was a, like a benefit for, to your social security. Of course that, that I think is more or less fair, but I'll just tell you the effects of this 600 bucks a week extra beyond unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. The 600 bucks a week, I think that they're right. What person would want to go back and that's what to work if they're given 2,400 bucks a month, I wouldn't mind getting 2,400 bucks a month. Sandy. Free money. They're not getting that little. No. The average person is getting almost a thousand a week in Vermont. I know, I know so, that. So well, that's what I'm saying. It points out two things, which Mark will agree with, is that first of all, everybody's underpaid. Yep. Nobody will go back to work because this is more money than they've ever gotten. Exactly, exactly. And nobody's paying people enough money to really survive in the States. Right. I know two or three employees that are working in places, not in restaurants, that I play golf with be, that say that nobody even comes in to apply for jobs and they have jobs available right. because of this, right. which it's a tough question. It's a really difficult question. You know, what do you do? Cut off everybody's lifeline because some people need it so that some of the people that kind of can go back to work will, or do you just keep it going? Because I don't believe people getting $1,000 a week are going to 
that I mean they're going to go back to work if they can keep getting up. Well, I'll just ask a simple question: Would you? No. And I wouldn't either. But oh, I'm no, not. No. That's that's wrong. If I loved my job. Yeah. Right. Like. And right. I was totally bored at home. The answer is yes. Okay. okay. I love being a lawyer, so I'm at work. Right. You know, I go to work. I like being a lawyer, so I go to work. But if I was working at some meatpacking plant, getting six hundred bucks a week extra, sure, if you were folding so meat into a bur to do it into a burrito at some place, you're not yeah, going to exactly, that exactly. So that's what the Republicans are saying, for better or for worse, Ian. I mean, I, I, I think they're being portrayed as being really lacking in humanity and generosity. But I just wanted to talk about the effects of that, and they're not probably willing to do it again. Uh, that, as far as I can tell, this new bill is not going to include that. It will still continue to have unemployment benefits, though, which are about three quarters of your wages. I've been on unemployment. I think it's about three quarters of your wages, which is enough to, I suppose, you eke along. However, it does mean that, you know, you eventually you have to go to work or lose those unemployment benefits. Um, it's it's a cruel system. I'm not denying well, that in the least. But there's many, it's a cruel there's many, system. There's no way that I would want to go back to work at most jobs in this stupid economy. But well, that, the, that's the effect of it is that, on the other hand, I think that the recovery plan is to get people back to work and to reopen the economy. And that's what Cuomo's, that's what some of the, of the states and mayors are doing, but they're not fully. I'll just give you an example of what I read in the New York Post today about New York City. I mean, like Cuomo says, well, you can open a bar, but you have to do food. Okay. And then he changes it and says you not only have to do food, but substantial food. What the hell does that mean? So the person who wants to reopen his bar, what is he supposed to, he or she supposed to do? Substantial food. I mean, they've been ham, they've, some places, which I think small businesses, which I think should reopen, are not really being allowed to. It's a very difficult question because you can't open at 50% right. and survive, right. and you can't right. hire the people back that were working there and survive and pay them. So, you know, you're a restaurant, they're saying you can be 50% open, so what, I can hire half my employees back, so the other half don't get money? So, you know, and they can't even get, they have to get their job back? I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a very difficult question. Right. But there's also a lot of other questions that are on people's minds. Um, again, Mark, I thought, wanted to talk about what's called, quote, cancellation culture. Maybe he would like to explain what he means. But um, I was really shocked to this morning to see that there were increasing protests slash destruction of property riots in places, uh, protests, and what has been considered to be riots in a city like Austin, Texas. I have no clue what is going on in those cities. I kind of know what's happening in Portland, but why Austin? What is the demand that's being made? And what is happening in a city like Austin that is causing these uh, really big protests? It is alleged that they're destroying property. There are no federal agents there yet. Um, I have no clue what's really going on at all. And, the, and I don't seem to, to get any, any real elucidation of anything from the press. So I didn't, anyway, that's what I sort of was on my mind today. Anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, I think what's going on in the three or four cities that are being talked about at the moment is actually going on in, in, in potentia or potentially in 50 or 100 cities mm -hmm. in, in this country. And what's going on is the ability of the population as a whole to understand that if they take to the streets, that can mean something. That understanding calls forth the exact um, match from the military, uh, militarized police mm -hmm. who are readying for this to break out nationally, not just in the cities that are being talked about. Trump's um, position with respect to it is uh, very, very threatening because he says he's got 40,000 people he's ready to bring in just from the forces he controls 
in the in the collective uh, of homeland security, all the departments that are in there, uh, and that he feels that it is his right and um, duty to bring in these uh, f federal agents mm -hmm. in, in, into situations of civic unrest. And so what's going on to me is a psychic phenomenon, just not, uh, I mean, not just, you know, who's, who happens to be spray painting in Portland or Seattle or, uh, you know, knocking down a fence. Uh, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. of increased violence in the country as the as the population realizes its potential strength and the uh, control, uh, you know, the civic control and military control realizes its uh, role in preventing the uh, resurg the surgeons of this uh, strength of this popular strength, and I think that's in that's what's going on in Portland. It is about to, about to be what's going on in Seattle. It's uh -huh. what's going on in Austin, and it, the fact that it hasn't gone on in in Burlington is you know just that we really don't have critical mass for that here. But in any larger city that can bring a bunch of people out into the street, everybody has something to demand because the general treatment uh, and the general economic structures that, that are anti-supporting the population are, are similar nationally. And, that, and that's what's going on. And I don't think it's a good idea to you know, analyze Portland, qua Portland, Seattle, qua Seattle, Chicago, qua Seattle, uh, Chicago, that it's all the same thing and it will break forth. Well, but I still, I, I kind of agree with you. But I still don't know. Okay, so you take, I mean, these protests began with the George Floyd death, and therefore they began as anti-police rallies. And by the way, let me mention something that did happen in Vermont, if you were reading Vermont Digger. Did you, did, have you been reading about, there was a, a bunch of white people, apparently, who got together in Montpelier and were protesting pro-cop, pro-police. And they were greeted by anti-police demonstrators, Black Lives Matter, I think, who were kind of trying to outshout them. And there was kind of a, almost a physical confrontation. And if you Great saw- photo, I love the photo of those yeah. two faces. Yeah, I did and... too. I liked the photo, except it was a bit scary. So you had this white guy without a mask, by the way, and, the, and one of the Black Lives Matter people standing almost touching noses. If you with saw a mask. It even with a mask and they were and I'm so I'm not sure that Vermont is going to be immune to this. No, um, but but all that I'm saying is that at the moment and what we'll probably see is these things uh, achieving <clears throat> much more um, depth and um, you know mutual destructiveness right nationally right and it'll take the form of of the particular cities and the particular chiefs of police and all of that, but that's what's happening. It's a national, well, I, okay, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. E economic, political uh, crisis. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, here's a possible e explanation, um, which it? is that this country has become economically polarized. Uh, you know, they're more highly in, there's a high degree of inequality. There's a high degree of uh, racial tension and, and uh, uh, inequality of opportunity for people of uh, different skin color. There are um, a, a lot of things that pe people are uh, re really upset about. And um, so they go out in the streets. Now, what, what is the response that we're seeing? The response is one of not of, um, of uh, de-escalating, uh, it's one of um, really of divisiveness and and use of force, use of tear gas, um, use of federal agents who don't really have the right training. They're trained to stop people coming over the border or apprehend them there. They're not tra trained for uh, civ uh, civil unrest. So um, what we're seeing as a response from those people who should be mature about this and, and, um, and hoping to actually solve the problem is they're not working, they're not going in that direction, they're inflaming the problem. 
Okay, the reason that I wanted to make a distinction between Portland and the Austin, for instance, is that I think what you're saying, Ian, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that because of the protest, I guess you're assuming that the protests, therefore, are nonviolent. Because of those protests, Trump is taking advantage of those protests to send in federal agents. And now the protests, at least in Portland, are against those federal agents. What your argument is, is that Trump re escalated that by sending in those protests. But I'm going to ask a different question. Well, but are you so that certain that it's not those all the protests are nonviolent. And I want to remind you, Ann, of the discussion we had on Thursday with Jack and Linda, who has a kid out in Portland. The kid says there are two types of protests, daily protests, which are nonviolent during the day, but then something weird happens at night. Whole different bunch comes out. And the different bunch at night are the ones that at least are being accused of, I don't know, truthfully or not, of smashing windows, of, of setting fires on the courthouse steps. So I'm going to ask another question, although I want to hear what Mark has to say first. Um, who are those protesters who are doing, if it's true, that kind of physical disruption, physical violence at least? I want to remind you, in Austin, there was a protester that was killed today. Did you see that? In Austin? I, I, I saw yeah. that. Um, yeah. and, 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 that. And the point is that there is no, uh, my point would be that yeah. there's no single cause. You know, we can't point to one thing like um, uh, even inequality. I mean, inequality, I suppose, is the overall um, theme to this, but people are upset about a whole bunch of different uh, issues, right. and, uh, and some of them, um, and their response is different. Some are going to protest peacefully about the issue that they're concerned about and some are going to protest violently. So, uh, you know, no, no, no single explanation no, and therefore no simple answers. Okay, Mark, what were you going to say? Well, the, the, the picture of this national protest and um, for varying reasons uh, in each place um, is now has now become part of Trump's uh, re-election strategy. That what he is going to run on, and it will run on, and, and his 43% will love it probably, uh, is being a law and order um, uh, president in the midst of a war, and he's in a double war, except the, the war, he, what he was running on before was to beat the virus or to first to deny it and now to you know send send the ventilators all over the world and be the the hero of ventilators whatever it is the it that hasn't worked out for him and what he seems to be pivoting to is to be a law and order president over the the chaos of this country and uh in order to do that successfully electorally successfully the chaos has to continue and the face of the federal government, the face of, uh, of the services that are controlled by Trump need to be front and center and doing their thing electorally. Uh, what about the Democratic electoral strategy? I, I don't see it. I mean, you, if they had a strategy, they wouldn't run Biden. You know? okay. I think that is it. Anyway, Pete, you got anything to say? What? I know what their strategy is. Go ahead. Just shut up and let Trump talk. It's it's doing he's doing all the right stuff right now. I mean, why would you why would you intervene right now? Why would you even present yourself? Why would you even go to a debate if you were Biden? I find Wait. a reason not to debate. Yeah, you wouldn't. And he uh, won't. He's he winning. Won't he's, well, I don't know that exactly. It, my question is if Trump comes out as having recovered the economy as having a reestablished law and order in the cities. He's gonna win. Anybody so I wanna know where the hell the Democrats, okay, this is what I think, bottom line. I wanna know who these protesters are, who are destroying property. It seems to me those protesters, if they're doing that, are calling in federal agents. But I, let that me, to me is really, really dangerous. Let me make a brief comment about this, because I have, so we all know that in, 
in times like this, there are peaceful protesters, there are provocateurs in some right, cases, right. because we know who benefits from this, and they're just people that are opportunists, okay? And people who are stupid, too. Well, and so I like to compare this to Occupy Wall Street, because so the question I have is, is this going to end the same way as yes. Occupy Wall Street? There were violent, violent, horrible things they did to the Occupy Wall Street protesters, and that was a way more peaceful movement so far than this one was. Right. There, had, there wasn't much rioting and looting and burning of buildings that I can remember during Occupy Wall Street. But there isn't now. You know, the, there's a nice little John Oliver five-minute piece that I watched just before here, which he, he um, shows Hannity talking about... Oh what sounds like yeah. a, a, a apocalypse uh, on Fox News and, and scrolling next to Hannity are these uh, many, many um, places that need putting down, right? Because of the violence. But then it turns out when you look at the list that most of the list is graffiti here, graffiti there, graffiti here and graffiti yeah. there. And there are some fires. But by and large, the, 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 this remains, and probably to great frustration of Trump, it remains a peaceful movement. Well, well, and, well but you can see I'm, another side to that, Mark. You can see I'm, it I'm, even I'm, in, if you read the New York Post today. Let me finish what I was yeah. going to say about this, though. Yeah. I think the other difference is, back in 08, there was an economic downturn because of the big crash. So there was a lot of mad people at the time, and so they organized, and they were mad, and they were mad at Wall Street and things, right? But the difference now is it's another economic downturn, but it's way worse than back then. And so not only do you have more unemployed people, you have more pissed off people. Every, everything is worse than it was in OA, really. The conditions are worse, and there's more people who have nothing to do. Right. So, right. And they have money. So they're getting sent money. So you got a person that's kind of on the edge that like, geez, you know, I always, I should have protested this, but back in 08, they might've still had their job and they were going to work and they had to go to work. Right now, they don't even have to go to work and they're going, you know what, I didn't get the protest back then, I'm gonna go out and do this. So I think the opportunity for a better result, I'm hoping will come out of that, that there's more people who sat on the sidelines that might've been in, involved in the previous um, thing that, that have come out now, so. But what is the demand? What is it? Yeah, what are these protesters looking to do? What I think do they want? Equality in yeah. the economy and in equal rights, right? I mean, well, I and, and no federal forces in their cities. Right. That's, right. That's, 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 that but the protests thing. are happening in cities without federal forces. And so, busted, that's, a, that's a new demand because in the beginning, that wasn't the original thing people right. were doing. The original demand was to defund the police, if you'll all recall, right? No, the original demand was concerning racism. Right. If we, if we think of this as starting with George Floyd. Right. It was an anti-racist analysis of the racism in, uh, you know, in, in, among white people admitting to the racism in their communities and being... Um, both castigated and supported by the black community. Uh, and so this was the big, the big issue initially. And then this was met. And, and it right away concerned violence, unnecessary violence on the part of people who carry guns. In this right. case, this, the, state uh, the city police of Milwaukee. So uh, it's about- Milwaukee. Yeah. Yep. Or Minnesota, where was it? It was, it was in Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis. I'm sorry, right. Minneapolis. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so um, anyway, I, I don't remember why I started. Yeah, well, in other words, they did the exact thing the protesters were protesting about. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it, relating back to, to COVID, you know, it's true that we've had these kind of, um, let's just say patho pathologic, uh, uh, tensions before how come it hasn't how come we haven't closed down the society well one thing is the society that we have now is way way worse as you were saying and way more vulnerable into collapse and the psychological yeah. state of the people right. in it is way more agitated and feverish right so so you know 
it's not the same uh, question about what happened and uh, how come we haven't closed down before. We haven't closed down because if it wasn't this, we're about to close down anyway from the collapse of capitalism. That's right. Overextended capitalism and wars. Right, right. right. But they, coll they collided. Um, anyway, but, but getting back to the original, I think what we were discussing was the uh, protests in the cities, city like Austin, which resulted in a death last night. Okay, I think we're approaching, by the way, the end of our time together. So I, again, what I think is the same thing that happened in the cities in the 60s. And that is you had protests, but you had people who were taking advantage of the peaceful, largely non-peaceful protest to provoke the entrance of the police and now I think federal agents into the city. And this is my worry, that, that might work and that Trump might very well send federal agents all over the place if the police in the cities are perceived as not being able to handle it, which was definitely true in Minneapolis. And therefore, are we facing a situation which could be martial law? And okay. that's what, go ahead, Pete. Well, and the other thing is, and I think this pertains is, is also you worry that the message will be diluted, which it kind of already has. You know, like we were just talking about, what was the original message? The original message was racism has never gone away. It's as bad now as it ever has been in the United States. And these people have been screwed, excuse my expression, for a long time. And it's time to straighten it out. Well, now what's happened, part of the dilution of the message now is, and, I, and I'm not against this, is this anti-police thing. So it's kind of shifted and focused on something and, and, and it's moving away and then they have the violence that so things are moving in a different direction and, and I'm worried that it's gonna lose the, the original focus of the thing. And people, we could have gone into the toppling of statues and the artwork and all this other stuff, which to me is part of the, is that part of the cancel culture, which I think some of it's a little overboard. People just get all excited, you know, and they go up and rip a statue down of some guy who is actually a civil rights leader. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's just, I said a lot of opportunists out there, and that's always kind of dangerous that they, they see a, a chance. In the end. I worry that the message gets diluted and have to refocus here. Well, I worry what Trump's next steps are going to be if the violence against property, especially federal property, uh, continues. I really, really, I guess, believe we are on the verge of uh, a total lack of democracy, and the election isn't going to be able to fix it uh, at all. But anyway, I think. But you recognize. Go ahead. Sorry. That, what? that the the troops, the feds, not troops. They're, they're not they're, troops, but yeah. the feds. Let's call them yeah, the, yeah. Uh, homeland security, unmarked, right. uh, unlabeled, right. um, unmarked car cat right. kidnappers. Right. Uh, that those people are operating way beyond the limits of yeah. the federal buildings that they're supposed to protect. Right. They're going right. out into the community, and so they then represent. A, a federal internal police force. Right, right. Couldn't agree with you more. I'm just asking to be, to think about what the consequences very well might be. I'll tell you one thing maybe, and then any, any last comments, is that the mayor of Chicago last night, did everybody see her on her press conference? Her name is uh, Lori, I think, Lightfoot. Yes. Uh, a black woman who said, we are not gonna allow the federal agents into Chicago and we will take every measure to prevent them from coming into Chicago. I really wonder what on earth she meant about that. Is there gonna be over, what is she gonna do if they do? Well, what can we'll she do? That, this is the very next yeah. crux right. exactly. of uh, defining this situation. Right. right, I agree. Anybody else have anything? Where are you, Ian, and in all this? And Ian? Well, really just that, what, troubles me mostly is that there's a lack of leadership you know ideally when the country faces multiple problems economic disease uh protests in the streets some people who who we've elected to represent us would come out and say okay let's sit down tell me what what we can do about this and instead what we're seeing is people in leadership roles digging in their heels and, and, and saying, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to listen to anybody else. I think we see that from, from Trump. We see that from his attorney general, William Barr, and uh, the whole 
So I don't and we see it from, unfortunately, we see it from the opposition in the but Democratic they're, Party. But they're not so. saying that, and Ian, that sounds passive. Yeah. They're saying, okay, and we're going to make it worse. Right, exactly. Or but they're going to say, we're going to make it work Trump. the way we think it should work. Is somebody telling Trump to do this? Did somebody tell yeah. Obama to quell Occupy yes. Wall Street? Or was yes. it his move? I mean, who's, who's calling the shots here? I know, that's a great question to end on. So look at, before we leave, I would like to say to you and to whatever audience we have that we'll be back in, in a week from Friday, which I don't know, is, is that the first week of August? At, uh, we'll, well, we'll record this at 1.30 a week from this Friday so that we don't have to do a million emails together and that I hope to be back on CCTV also. So thank you all. For, and especially thanks to Ian for putting this all together. Okay, so Ian, and you're going to record this, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be here. All right, great. And Mark, bye. See you later, okay. you guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Andy, you're in the dark, by the way. You need more light. <laughs> I, of course, I always do. All right, all right bye. bye. bye.